So shall we look to the Lord in prayer before we go to his word. Thank you, loving Heavenly Father, for your precious presence in our midst. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We worship you. We bow down before you. We are so privileged to sit together at your feet as your children, to hear from you and to learn from one another as the Holy Spirit ministers to our heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the Lord who speaks with fire that will kindle our hearts afresh with your love. You alone can speak in a way that can burn our hearts out of love for you, out of zeal and passion for you. Help us, Father. We want to decrease. We want to be a zero before you so that, Lord, you can cleanse us thoroughly with your blood and flood our hearts afresh with your Holy Spirit. And we want rivers of living water from you, Lord Jesus, flooding our hearts, overflowing us, overflowing from us. And we want words that are spirit and are life. Yes, for, yes, Lord, we want your life to be imparted to us through your word as we meditate that. And we want to know your mysteries. We want to know them, not just in the head, but Lord, we have we want to have them revealed to our spirit as this, with the spirit of revelation through the Holy Spirit as we humble ourselves and as our flesh, as our self will is being wrenched by the twist word of the word of God as we surrender everything before you, Lord Jesus. Help us, Father. We want to be enlightened in our hearts to see your glory and to be transformed to your glory so that, Lord, we can build your church wherever we are placed and glorify your name and be prepared and to prepare others even as your coming is so near. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' precious Peter's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So it's really the Lord's privilege that the Lord enabled us to gather like this for so many, I think so many years, of course, uh, at least a few years. Uh, and we were seeing, we were literally beholding the Lord Jesus more and more, the glory of the Lord Jesus in the mirror of his word in the book of Revelation. And we were at the closing verses of Revelation chapter 2. The message to the church at Thyatira, although it was a it was the smallest of all the uh, cities compared to the other uh, six churches, it received a long letter, mostly of correction. There were some things that the Lord could appreciate. Verse 19, I know your deeds, your love, your deeds of later greater than at first. But still that elder was uh, such a weak and such a effeminate, such a powerless person that he tolerated a wicked woman uh, who took the control of the church literally and was running the show, who called herself a prophetess, verse 20. And she was teaching. And we saw last week that uh, women can teach younger women and children, but not uh, man, uh, because actually that is the order that the Lord has placed in the church uh, for his own, in his own wisdom and in his own uh, uh, sovereignty. And uh, <laughs> We all know, as we know, that verse in Galatians 3, 28, there is neither no, man nor woman, uh, every, uh, all are one in Christ. That is so true. But at the same time, we, I mean, if we are unfamiliar with that verse, and one thing that is uh, amazing about that verse is that we are reading about a the uniform there. <laughs> you know, we all know the school uniform or some staff uniform. If everybody wears this uniform dress, will be very difficult to identify you know? you know suppose we go to a school and we want to pick up the children everybody is wearing the same uniform it is very difficult to you know uh, uh, among all the children to make oh this is our we have to look intently at the face and identify so here uh revelation sorry galatians chapter 3 uh, verse 28 says about there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One in Christ Jesus, and what's the uniform? Verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have put on the uniform, have clothed yourself with Christ. So uh, his banner over me is love. Uh, Song of Songs chapter 2, we read that. So his banner of love is there. The mantle of the Holy Spirit is there. <clears throat> Everyone who is baptized into Christ Jesus. And that refers to Holy Spirit baptism, I believe. Because, you know, just by taking water baptism, we do not see believers clothed, being clothed with Christ. But those who are uh, endued from above with the power from above. Uh, Luke 24, 48, 49 says about, read 
till wait in jerusalem till you receive till you are clothed with power from on high <laughs> so it is the clothing of the holy spirit uh, that will help us to clothe with christ because the holy spirit is the spirit of christ when we are clothed with, when we are filled with the holy spirit and the holy spirit overflows uh, from our life that will overflow into our soul from our spirit into our soul and through our body through our body means through what we say through what we see our looks and facial expressions and what we hear what we speak and what we do it would be the holy spirit the power of the holy spirit will be overflowing from our soul through our body and others who will be seeing us will be seeing the mantle of christ the clothing of christ the, that is a bridal garment or that is the spiritual armor Ephesians 6 says about the spiritual armor. Revelation 19 says about the br uh, bridal garment, fine linen, which are the righteous works of the saints. And this is a priestly garment as we read in Revelation 1, Jesus with the priestly garment. And we are the royal priesthood. We are mini priests. He is the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. We are mini priests and priestesses uh, after him. And we all have this clothing of Christ. His banner over me is love. Holy Spirit floods us with love. Romans 5 5. So you're all clothed with Christ when we are baptized, immersed in Christ, immersed in the Holy Spirit, not just in waters of baptism. Waters of baptism is a uh, is a act is an act of obedience that uh, that symbolizes that our old man which continue which wanted to continue in sin is dead, and we bury that old man in the waters of baptism, and we are raised up as a new man to walk in the newness of life as we uh, read in Romans 6, 1 to 4, we read about that meaning of water baptism. But just by the burying the old man, <laughs> uh, we won't be clothed with Christ. The, there is another thing that has to be crucified. Old man is already, old, or has already old man. Old man and flesh, many people think it is synonymous. But actually, if you look into the Bible, as we hear from the Zach also, these are not, uh, old man and flesh are, different old man is that mindset to continue which wanted to continue in sin which a truly born again person can say that i do not want to continue in sin i might fall into sin but i do not want to continue in sin a truly born again person as as most of us are we know that we do not want to continue in sin we do not want to see sin even once that means our old man which wanted to continue in sin in our unconverted days has died and knowing that our old self has died in christ uh, romans 6 6 old man we need not kill the old man old man has already uh, has already died has already died in christ jesus when di christ died on the cross our old man also died in christ we need not crucify that old man what we need to crucify is the flesh that is our self will every day so that is the difference between old man and the flesh so in the water baptism old man we are burying old man who is already dead we are burying but in the holy spirit baptism what happens uh, when we are flooded with the holy spirit the Holy Spirit sets its desire against the flesh, and the flesh sets its desire against the Holy Spirit. So, uh, through the Holy Spirit baptism, our flesh is made more and more dormant, and uh, the Holy Spirit all powers our flesh, and uh, our flesh is more and more broken as we are, as we continue to surrender ourselves and are being flooded with the Holy Spirit and being immersed with the Holy Spirit all the more. So, uh, Galatians 3.27 should refer to Holy Spirit baptism. Then only those who are baptized into Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, has clo have clothed themselves with Christ. And that is a uniform. Everybody is clothed with Christ. And there is neither. You know, if you com compare, you know, if you see that continual flow of the 27 and 28, then you will understand this. Uh, all are clothed with Christ. So, there is neither. Jew no Greek. Jewish people and non-Jewish people were the greatest difference uh, that the world has ever seen because actually Jewish people were so uh, exclusive about uh, themselves. They wouldn't mingle with other people. But through the cross, there is neither Jew nor Greek. The Greek meaning uh, the whole of non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. <laughs> and there is neither slave nor free man. Slave and uh, free man. That was the another great contrast. And male, no female. Uh, you know, tradition says that Jewish people, Jewish men would rise up in the morning and 
would thank God, saying that, uh, God, I thank you that I am a Jew, I am a man, I am I'm a free man, I am not a slave. <laughs> so, but actually, you know, Paul through the Holy Spirit is saying that there is neither male nor female, for you are all in one crisis, one in crisis. So, with respect to our access to the Lord, to our potential to have intimacy and fellowship with the Lord, and there is no difference between man and a, uh, a man and a woman. But uh, just like Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all equal, but the Father uh, is the head of Christ, and Christ has voluntarily chosen to submit to the Father, and the Holy Spirit is a hidden person, uh, you know, through which the uh, uh, Holy Spirit is the breath of. Uh, father and breath of Christ and the Father. He is the breath, Rua or Numa. Uh, Rua, that is a Hebrew word. Numa is the Greek word. <laughs> Ruha or Rua. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, women, um, they have their own glorious ministry in the church, mostly in a hidden way. And outside the church meeting, uh, they can reach out to so many sisters and children and all but when they take up the leadership in the church uh, which uh, they are not called to and when they run the show behind the scenes in a hidden manner in a subtle manner and all then that really incurs the wrath of god and uh, how the lord is uh, rebuking that elder there here in revelation 2 uh, and um, uh, this woman was leading uh, even the Lord's born servant extra. They were truly born again uh, people <laughs> who really wanted to become disciples of Christ. They were also swayed away by the teaching of this woman and uh, there was spiritual immorality. That means ad worldliness, spiritual immorality, adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is an enmity with God? James 4.4 4. And there was spiritual idolatry greed, love of money amounting to idolatry, Colossians 3, 5. And all was, uh, all was there. I gave her time to repent. She does not want to repent of immor immorality. Even the mercy of God that even to such a wicked woman, the Lord is giving time to repent. But the Lord uh, you know, clearly is saying that she does not want to repent. Uh, behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness. Uh, that of sickness is actually in italics. It is not in the original Greek, but I'll throw her on a bed, meaning but of sickness that is implied over there. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. This is, as we last week also we saw, this is not the great tribulation, the days of Antichrist, because this is the first century church. Antichrist, of course, is it to be revealed. So this is the great tribulation, which was a punishment from God. So we read in Romans 2, 9, as well as here, Romans 2, 22, about the great tribulation, as a, uh, that word being used as a uh, expression of the wrath of God, and, of course, the great tribulation in the days of Antichrist, which is actually wrath of Satan through the man Antichrist against God's people. So both are totally different. So the church will go through that great tribulation is what we clearly see from the scriptures, which is uh, unlike what is taught widely in Christen Christendom. So, uh, and uh, verse 23 I will kill her children with pestilence. So we understand from there that it is not the uh, children of physical adultery because God, a just God, would not do uh, injustice against children born out of physical adultery because children didn't do any sin in that. But this is the spiritual children who uh, who were kind of half con converts, uh, uh, not who are really repented hearing the true love of Christ and the gospel of Christ. But they are just, uh, you know, fans of Jezebel Fans Association, JFA. <laughs> they were just followers of this fancy woman. And, uh, uh, you know, they uh, came to church just to, you know, see her show and her so-called prophecy and so-called visions and dreams or whatever. And, uh, you know, I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches <laughs> the minds and the heart. <laughs> In KGV, it is written, uh, instead of minds, it is written reigns. And uh, that from that word, only the renal and the, uh, the actual Greek word used over there is kidneys. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, actual Greek word that is used over there is nephros, which uh, literally means kidneys. But uh, symbolically, just like heart, 
is uh, when uh, Bible says, I know your heart, it is not the four-chambered heart that is pumping left up. Uh, we know that it is the, uh, it refers to our innermost being, uh, mostly heart, the word heart in the Bible refers to a spirit. Sometimes it refers to the uh, spirit and soul together also. So uh, just like heart refers to uh, spirit and or spirit and soul together, that is the inner court in, in contrast to the outer court. Inner court, there were two parts. That was the holy place and the most holy place. That is the spirit and the soul. Uh, so uh, just like heart refers to that, kidneys was a uh, uh, term that was that would refer to the inner, just like kidney would be, kidney is a very deep inner organ we know. And uh, so like that, uh, kidneys was a, uh, kidney was a word that would refer to the soul part, that would refer to the uh, intentions and uh, uh, thoughts and emotions and decisions. You know, I would read the strong dictionary of that uh, nephros, used of innermost thoughts, feelings, and purposes of the soul. Thoughts, feelings, purposes, that means decisions. Thoughts, feelings, purposes is actually, that comprises the soul. So, uh, I, uh, or in other words, we can, uh, we can paraphrase that I who searches the souls and the spirit, the Lord searches our soul to know that whether our soul, that is our, uh, our soul comprises of our thoughts, our emotions and our decisions, whether our thoughts, emotions and decisions are under the control of the Holy Spirit or under the control of our, our own self, the Lord is searching that and the Lord searches our hearts also, the spiritual condition of our spirit, how much our inner man has the life of Christ, has the glory of Christ. It, is it just words that we are speaking of? Our inner man is the is our inner man renew, being renewed daily, just like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, my inner man is being renewed day after day, after day although the outer man is decaying. In the proportion that the outer man, that is our self-will, is broken, that proportion of inner man, our spirit will be renewed or transfigured to the likeness of Christ through the imparting of the life of Christ when we go the way of the cross, that is the way of humbling ourselves and surrendering ourselves to the Lord. And we, uh, you know, the exact, uh, uh, this verse 23 can be taken as a quotation from Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 10. Uh, last week, I was not able to say that reference, actually. It, I mean, of course, although it was a uh, well-known verse, Jeremiah 17.9 is more of a well-known verse. 17.10 also uh, is what the Lord is referring to here. If you turn to the book of Jeremiah, then chapter 17, <coughs> verse uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are all, you know, you know, mostly quoted verses. I mean, if you'd be familiar with those verses, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 says, Cursed is the man, thus, thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is trusting in mankind. Mankind can include himself or, and other people. You know, when we trust other people than God or when we trust ourselves, oh, I can do uh, even if, uh, you know, I do not get any help from the Lord, I can do it. with that self-arrogance, if I'm saying like that, then of course, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is another thing, Philippians 4.13. But uh, if I'm depending on my self-will and my strength, and I'm saying that my self-confidence, and I'm saying that I can do that, then that is a very cursed condition. Uh, cursed is a man who trusts in mankind. You know, in the world people say that you you should have self confidence. <laughs> we in Christ we say that you should have Christ confidence, not self confidence. Of course, you know what we <laughs> mean by self confidence is also important. Like, you know, if we mean is that uh, you know that uh, the Lord will empower us to do everything. Of course, you know it is not it is the Lord is not legalistic about the word that we use, but what we mean by that. Uh, so, uh, self-confidence, uh, you know, it can be a misno. It can uh, mean a uh, mean some other thing, uh, as the world says. That's why we prefer to use Christ confidence rather than self-confidence as Christians. Of course, actually, you know, uh, you know, the Lord has given us um, many faculties and many 
uh, many skills and talents in our soul, in our body. We can use, utilize all that. But our confidence is not in all that. Our confidence is in the Lord. And uh, we do not have any confidence in our own abilities. But we, just like, you know, a musician, a Christian musician, or a Christian preacher, a, you know, a Christian preacher, he might know much about the Bible, much of the word of God, a Christian musician, yeah, he or she might be very talented in singing, but her, her his uh, dependence is not on, uh, dependence of glory is not in his or her ability or his knowledge or his capacity or experience, but on the Lord. He said, Lord, you have given me all that and but I surrender everything on the cross. I surrender everything on the altar and say that, Lord, you empower me and I want to use all those gifts that the Lord you have given me for you and for your church, not for the, uh, not for exalting myself, but for exalting you alone, Lord. So yeah, that is cursed is a man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert, or oh, a bush in the desert. What's the, what? Uh, what would be the plight of that bush? You no, know, in the desert, and will not see when prosperity comes, but live in stony ways in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant, spiritual dryness. There is always perpetual dryness and uh, being in want and uh, no joy, no peace of mind, no rest in the heart like that. <laughs> But in contrast to that, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord, whose trust his trust is not only his trusting in the Lord, his trust is the Lord himself. For he will be a, he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends his root by a stream, the streams of the living water, the Holy Spirit, and will not fear when the heat comes, when adversity comes, when the sun rises, the adversity, temptations come. He will not fear because uh, the root has gone deep. And like the seed on the rocky so rocky ground, <clears throat> but its leaves will be green, and it will be it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. Always there will be fruit because even uh, despite all the adverse circumstances, adverse people around, uh, the uh, if we trust in the Lord, has surrendered ourselves unto the Lord, and uh, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will keep on nourishing us. To the word of God and uh, we'll be yielding the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life, in our ministry, uh, life. There will be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Galatians 5, 22, 23. And there will be fruit of our ministry. Many lives around us will be touched by the life of Christ through us. And then it says this verse, verse 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else. Actually, in the Old Testament, they had... Uh, they did not have that much light as we have in the New Testament. So when they say heart, actually the heart, meaning the spirit and the flesh, that is our self will is together. Just like uh, the, you know, self will is like, like, like the pericardium of the heart, you know, <laughs> covering the heart. <laughs> so when Jeremiah 4, 4 says, circumcise your hearts, what is basically meant is actually the, skin of our heart that is our self will the veil that has to be rent in our life that is it circumcise your heart uh jeremiah 4 4 deuteronomy 30 verse 6 deuteronomy chapter 33 0 verse 6 is circumcise your hearts so that means the circumcision of our heart is actually the way of the cross uh bible here in the new testament also says about the circumcision not made with hands but with the uh, not, um, not made with hands, but by the Spirit uh, in Colossians 3, uh, Colossians 2, 11. There we read about the circumcision made without hands. So that is actually through the twist word of the word of God, the fiery twist word of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. The self-will is being rent and that is the circumcision of the heart. So when uh, the Bible says, um, when Jeremiah in the Old Testament says, heart is more deceitful than anything else, uh, we know that in the New Testament, you know, there is this circumcision of the heart through the, uh, the circumcision of the heart was really made possible through Jesus when Jesus uh, rent the veil of the Jerusalem temple through his death. So uh, the Holy Spirit began to indwell our spirit in the new covenant only. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was upon them, came upon them, but the Holy Spirit couldn't indwell them because the 
eyes of the heart, the conscience couldn't be cleansed by the blood of the bulls and gods, but the blood could only cover their sins. Uh, Psalm 32 one says that blessed is the man whose sins are covered. So only that could, that much covering only was there in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. First John 1 7. So the because the conscience could be cleansed, uh, the Holy Spirit can come inside our heart and we are born again and we grow in our heart, in our spirit. So when the Bible says the heart is more deceitful than anything else in the New Testament light, we have to understand that it denotes our flesh. Because actually, uh, you know, our flesh is deceitful than anything else. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the flesh was so uncircumcised along with the heart that when the uh, Bible says the heart is more deceitful, it is not the spirit per se, but it is the uh, flesh that is deceitful than anything else. And when Jesus says, out of the heart comes all the evil thoughts and clean thoughts and all, what Jesus means is actually because, you know, when Jesus was speaking to the disciples at that time also, their hearts were uncircumcised. That means actually the flesh was uh, so adherent to their hearts. So out of their hearts flow all that basically meant that out of their flesh. Uh, even today from our flesh only flow all the evil thoughts and every evil sinful things and all comes from our flesh, from our self. -will. But uh, what we can the glorious way of the cross that the Lord has paved way for us is that when we surrender ourselves, ourselves, our flesh every day, when we crucify our flesh by surrendering our flesh or ourself to the Lord, the Lord can empower us in our spirit and this flesh can be more and more rent and uh, we can live a life where the flesh is not predominant. The flesh is more and more conquered by the Holy Spirit. If we live according to the Spirit, we won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5, uh, 16 and 18, we read that. Uh, Galatians 5, if you keep your finger here, and Galatians 5, 16 exactly. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Verse 18 says, you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. So coming back here, I, uh, the heart is more deceitful than all else. And uh, what we have to understand uh, from that tabernacle perspective is that, uh, to be exact, the flesh is more deceitful than all else. In the Old Testament, it was a heart of stone. But in the New Testament, the prophecy in Ezekiel 36, 26 is that he will replace a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. So now we have a heart of flesh. And uh, that heart of flesh is not deceitful, but the flesh other into this heart, which is being rent every day as we surrender everything to the Lord, uh, that flesh is deceitful than anything else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Oh, there is nothing good dwelling in this flesh, Paul, ex Paul exclaims in Romans 7, 18. And then verse 10, the verse we were coming to, I, the Lord, searches the heart, I test the mind. So the heart and the soul, mind, uh, denoting part of a soul, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. And that is what is recorded in Romans 2, 6, as well as in uh, Revelation 2, 23. Uh, so the Lord searches our, our the condition of our spirit and our soul. And according to our deeds, the Lord would be rewarding us. And we already saw in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, deeds in our private life, the Lord would be judging the hidden things in darkness. And in the public life, uh, it is not the deeds that is being judged, but rather the motives behind those deeds that is being judged. So private life and public life, both the deeds are, would be judged. In the private life, that would be uh, that which, which are not cleansed by the blood of Christ would be revealed there and would be judged and we would be rewarded according to that. And the public life, why we did what we did, we might have a priest, we might have prayed, we might have sang, we might have did, done many good deeds. And But why did we do that? Did we do it out of love for the Lord? Or we did just to show off to people that I have a great spiritual giant or something like that. Uh, so why did we do more the things hidden in that? The two exam, two questions in the final year question, final exam question paper. As Brother Zex put it, uh, 1 Corinthians 4 5, things hidden in darkness and motives of men's heart. Things in, hidden in darkness is a private life when nobody around, nobody else is seeing us, what we do in private when nobody is around us. And 
whatever we did in public motives why we did what we did when we were uh, with other people and, and depending on that would be the reward and uh, uh, there would be people who would be having a hundredfold harvest not because they are sinlessly perfect nobody is sinlessly perfect but they pressed on to the perfection of Christ despite all their failures with perseverance they bore fruit to maturity as Luke 8 15 we read <laughs> after the parable of the sower <laughs> so those who comprise the hundredfold harvest would comprise the bride of Christ who overcome gone beyond the veil and have sat as a joint heir of life along with the bridegroom Jesus Christ I will grant to him to those who overcome as I overcame uh, and sat with on my father's throne to those who overcome, I will also grant to them to sit with me on my throne. That is the bride of Christ. And the 60-fold harvest and the 30-fold harvest, they would they are also blessed compared to those who are in hell, but they would be uh, invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is what we read in Revelation 19, verse 9. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So do we want to be just in, be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, or do we want to become part of the bride of Christ? Uh, to those who overcome, I will give authority. I will give grant to sit with me. Is what uh, grant to sit with me is what we read in Revelation three twenty one. And here, uh, so the Lord is a Lord who rewards according to our deeds. Our deeds. I mean, some people say that ah, anyway, we are born again, so whatever we do is unimportant. That means they haven't read their Bible at all properly, or they have been taught uh, or deceived. Uh, you know, thoroughly, they have been taught in a wrong uh, by deceiving teachers who themselves would be would be deceived, blind leading the blind, both falling into pit, as Jesus Himself warned. So there are many people who say that uh, ah, once we are born again, anyway, we are on our way to heaven, and uh, whatever we live, although they may not say it explicit explicitly like that, but the way they live, it's as if, uh, anyway, we have got the visa, the passport to heaven. And uh, you now, anyway, we'll do something bare minimum, and anyway, we'll go to heaven. Uh, we'll live as we like, and uh, you know, uh, such people would, uh, you know, such people wouldn't be even. Uh, most of these people wouldn't be there even in the sixty-fold or thirty-fold harvest. They would have lost their salvation long ago. They would be like the uh, seeds on the rocky soil. Immediately receive their word with joy, but there were no roots. When the adversity came, uh, they when the temptation and adversity came, they went their own way, not the way of the cross. So uh, God will reward according to our deeds, verse 30, 23. And we saw the same emphasis throughout the Bible. It is there, Revelation 22, the last page of page of our Bible, Revelation 22, 16. The same thing we read. What, do, what did we read there? Uh, uh, not verse 16, verse uh, verse 12 rather, Revelation 22 verse 12, behold I am coming quickly and my, many times we think that oh, the Lord is not coming, the Lord is delaying but he says that he is coming quickly and when he comes it will be sudden quick and my reward is with me to render to each every man according to what he has done and we all have to not only unbelievers, unbelievers will be judged Revelation 20 but as believers, before the thousand year reign, just after Jesus' second coming, before the thousand year reign begins, there will be a reward that would be according to our faithfulness, according to our deeds. And uh, uh, there would be, we all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, Romans 14, 12, and 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We read all those verses last week also. And verse 24, but I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, <laughs> of course, you know, that's a great hope. Uh, it was not, the Thyatira church was not just JFA, not just Jezebel's fans association. There were some people who were who were sighing and who were praying to the Lord, Lord, glorify your name, let your kingdom come, your name be hallowed, your name is being uh, put to shame by this wicked woman in this church and your Lord, glorify your name and they would have been sighing and praying and they would have probably even returned to John the Apostle. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> but uh, there were some, we don't know how many, whether the majority or probably the minority. Or, you know, most probably it would be the minority. <laughs> uh, but the rest who are, who are in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who do not hold this wretched teaching of this 
uh, Jezebel, who have not known the deep things of Satan. Oh, so they were saying that, oh, you know, God, they would have said, oh, deep things of God. Uh, you know, they would have said that, oh, we have got these mysteries, this revelation from God. I got this revelation, this vision. I got this interpretation and deep things of God. And oh, they would have, you know, said that. And, uh, you know, sarcastically, the Lord is calling it deep things of Satan. <laughs> so, you know, when, uh, you know, this letter would have been read in the church in Thayathura, uh, and uh, those people who would have kept themselves pure from this teaching and all, <clears throat> you would have rejoiced, oh, the Lord is calling it deep things of Satan, not deep things of God. As they call, uh, you know, you know, deep things of Satan. As they call them, hey, you know, they would have called deep things, but deep things of God or something they would have called, or deep things of Jesus or whatever. But God is calling them deep things of Satan, as they call them. I place no other burden on you. <laughs> Already you were you were so burdened and crushed all these years or months, whatever. This Jezebel was running the show. There you were all kind of tormented. You were suffering. Uh, you just uh, you know endured. Uh, but uh, I, I place no other burden on you. <laughs> you are already, uh, I'm so compassionate. I'm so mindful of you, my children, there who are, uh, you know, sighing. Uh, they just like the Israelite, the Israelites were sighing and praying when they were oppressed by the Egyptians, no? And God heard their sigh and said, Moses, you know, that blessed portion in, is, uh, is Exodus chapter 2, last verses, right? Chapter 3, verse 1. So Exodus chapter 2, last verses where we read verse 23, Exodus, 20, Exodus 2, 23. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed. There was a sigh. And, uh, you know, when there is uh, so much of unrighteousness around us, so sometimes actually, you know, yes, uh, you know, sometimes it can be even in the church that we are part of or whatever. Uh, the sons of Israel sighed for help, sighed because of the bondage. They cried out and they cry for help because of the bondage brought up to not just the ceiling, but up to God there in the third heaven. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel and God took notice of them. What a blessed was God took notice of them. Sometimes actually you might be working in some work in our workplace or you know neighborhood or you know family and all some people would be sighing <laughs> uh, lord when i'll be delivered <laughs> some of her uh, you know uh, sisters and all are going through tough times in their families and all they have shared with us and uh, you know even me myself and <laughs> srigala and all separately we were in house arrest you know initial days of faith and all when uh, parents and all were, you know, because of their human love for us, they uh, restricted us from going to any church meeting. So there was a sigh, oh Lord, when will I, <laughs> we'll be groaning. <laughs> and the so it is so encouraging to see that God saw the sons of Israel, God took, took notice of them. Now Moses was pastoring. Oh, now the hero is coming. The Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. The Lord is there in the bush, burning bush blazing fire in the midst of a bush, verse 2. And the Lord is mindful. The Lord remembers, just like in Genesis 8, 1, it says, God remembered Noah. So here, God remembered the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Lord remembers his promises. And sometimes for a time being, for our own cleansing, for our own spiritual strengthening, <laughs> the Lord would be taking us through some tough times. Sometimes even in the church, sometimes even in our workplace, sometimes even in our family, neighborhood, or whatever situation. Lord in his sovereignty, he knows how many days we are to endure that trial. Just like Revelation 2, 10, to the Smyrna church, 10 days you will have tribulation. <laughs> so there is a stipulated time. It is not, uh, you know, I will not grieve the uh, sons of God. I will not grieve them forever. You know, that verse in Lamentation, Lamentation chapter 3, I am not um, grieving them willingly. It is not that it is not that God is sadistic and He is uh, taking a you know He is deriving pleasure when we are suffering. But lamentation just after Jeremiah, lamentation the 
another book by the prophet Jeremiah, Lamentation chapter 3, verse 31. The, for the Lord will not reject forever. For if he causes grief, then he will have compassion. According to his abundant loving kindness, for he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. It is not willingly that the Lord is uh, afflicting us, but uh, the Lord is allowing because there is no other go, no other way. The Lord is allowing that for a time be. And uh, uh, so coming back to yeah, verse 24, uh, Revelation 2.24, the deep things of Satan, that deep things, that word is bathas, and deep things, or depths, it can be translated. KJV translates as depths. And I was seeing, uh, because we are doing a word by word by the study, I was uh, seeing where all this word depths come in the New Testament, this bathas, that word comes there. Uh, so one Revelation 2.24 we just saw. Another phrase is actually, uh, just now we were saying about that, the seed on the rocky ground, Matthew 13.5. And I was seeing that nine times that word bathas comes. That's, it's very interesting uh, to know where all this word depths, depth can uh, be translated as depth or height or deep, extreme poverty, deep things of God. And uh, Matthew 13, 5, where Jesus says that parable of the sower, there, if we turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 5, <laughs> others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up, sprang up because they had no depth, they go, because they had no bathas of soil. No depth was there. So the Lord wants us to have depth. Uh, the roots going deep, maybe the when we hear the word of God, of course, our emotions might be stirred up. Oh, we want to commit ourselves to the Lord, we are reminded of the love for the Lord, and uh, we are challenged. Emotions are stirred up, that's good, but we need to meditate, and our minds have to be instructed, and that shouldn't uh, stop there, also, it has to go deeper to uh, the realm of our will where we surrender our will to the Lord, where our, the strong will, the rocky will is blasted so that uh, the word would enter our spirit realm and there will be a revelation of the word that word become flesh in our spirit. The word would, would become part of our spirit. The word, word would become a experience, a revelation and obedience in our spirit realm where we experience the word of God. So that is, uh, you know, when we hear the word of God, uh, through the body, that is through our ears and through our eyes, when we hear or see the word of God, the word of God enters our eyes, through our ears, the word of God enters our body, that is the rocky places. When it has entered only the bodily realm, we haven't even understood what is being preached, then that is only the rocky places, uh, sorry, the roadside, not the rocky places, sorry. The, seed on the roadside, but it has just stirred up the emotions. It has gone a little more deeper. Our emotions are stirred up. That means actually, immediately with joy, we received the word, at least the rocky places, but uh, there were no, there was no depth. But in the, but uh, some people, even they, they are meditating and they are, they know the cross reference and this reference and that reference. Their mind is being instructed by the word of God. That means actually, even to the Thorny places that uh, root are, roots are there, but the thorns haven't been burned up by the fire of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the thorns are still there. The thorns uh, haven't been burned up by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Thorns can be burned up. Thorns, that is the money, honor, pleasures, money, worries, and pleasures, as Jesus says in Luke 8 14, can be burned up by the fire of the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 27, 10 says that the fire of the Holy One of Israel will burn up all the thorns. So that can be burned up when the thorns are surrendered. The thorns are from our flesh only and uh, from, from our self-will, that thick veil. And that has to be sub surrendered to the to the sword of the word of God. And the fire of the Holy Spirit will burn up the thorns in our life, the money, the love for money and love for honor and worries and love for pleasures and all would be burned up continually not once in a day but 
is a continual burned offering. And uh, then the word will enter the spirit realm and will become a revelation. Then we are obeying the word of God. That word has become a revelation for us. God has hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them into babes. Those who are surrounded themselves as, as babes are experiencing the word of God. Those who just know the word of God are the wise and intelligent people. Uh, they think that I know everything, but they know nothing as they ought to know. If somebody thinks that he knows, he hasn't known as he ought to know. That is what we read in Galatians 6. You know, keeping a finger here, if we go to Galatians 6, there is that word of warning where we read that uh, verse 3. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And uh, uh, if uh, anybody thinks that he knows uh, anything, uh, he hasn't known as he ought to know. That is in First Corinthians 8.2. 1 Corinthians 8.2 8 says, if anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. <laughs> if you think that I know something, I, I know this much, that means actually a person who has truly known the Lord will say the Lord, I do not know anything. I just know that uh, <laughs> you are enough for me. But uh, if we suppose that we know anything, he has not known as he ought to know. We need to know the Lord in our spirit realm. So Matthew 13, 5, Mark 4, 5, the same portion in Mark's gospel. Mark 4, 5, the same portion. There is also the uh, parable. Then Luke 5, 4 is another place where the ba bathas, the depth is used. Cast your net into the deep. That is bathas. Jesus wants us to cast our nets into the depths of God. Romans 8, 39, uh, nobody, uh, neither height nor depth can separate us from the love of God. Romans 11, 33, oh, the depths of God, uh, you know, such an exclamation. Uh, Paul is saying there, Romans 11, 33, oh, the depths of the riches, depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his words. And, First Corinthians 2 10. Yeah, we just saw the deep things of Satan, <laughs> but there is the deep things of God also. They claim that it was the deep things of God, but the true deep things of God, who will know? First Corinthians 2 10. For to us, God revealed them through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God, Bathas of Theos. So, depths of God, the Holy Spirit searches all things, even the Deep. I mean, actually, even we know that, uh, you know, when we read the Bible, we can just read through and go, oh, when we are meditating together, we know how much the Lord has been teaching us through the word of God. And we know, oh, the word had this much depth. Oh, this much depth was there. I didn't know that. But the same Bible I was reading, but now only I knew, oh, this much deeper, deeper things are there. So that is actually the Holy Spirit only can reveal to us the deep things of God. And the Lord reveals only to a one category of people, to the babes, to the humble. When we humble ourselves like a little baby, the Lord will reveal to us. But we, if we think that I know something, the Lord will say that, yeah, you keep on seeing that and you will keep on hearing and you will not understand. You will keep on seeing and you will not see. So if we but humble ourselves to be zero and say that, Lord, I do not know. I want to know you more, Lord. Then the Lord will show us more and more. Then Second Corinthians 8 2 says about the poverty, deep poverty of uh, the uh, Christians there. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. Uh, in a great deal of affliction, the abundance of joy and the deep poverty, the deep, this bath has deep poverty, overflowed in the wealth of the liberality. So there are also depths. Then Ephesians 3 18 is the last verse. Ephesians, uh, the height and depth and uh, depth of the love of God. Ephesians 3.18, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and the height and the depth of the, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge. So uh, that is uh, Bathas. So the deep things of Satan, they were holding on to, uh, that they have special revelation and all. But uh, even today also, 
probably i mean we i do not have this time to go through all those youtube videos and all but actually when we sometimes we then see those youtube videos where there are some prophetesses and prophetess even prophets who have great revelation and uh, but they are after you know money only if they you know uh, just to know a simple way to know whether they are false prophets uh, true prophets one criteria is whether they are asking for money uh, you know jesus or his apostles uh they never ask for money for themselves for or for their ministry paul asked for money for the suffering poor people in the churches not for himself or his ministry or anything like that so but uh, when these um, babylonian preachers today ask for money for themselves and for their ministry then there is a clear indication that whatever fancy revelation that they say or have or claim to have are uh, just the deep things of satan only so you know we shouldn't be deceived uh some if somebody says that no oh, they are all great people let them go <laughs> we are not here to prevent anybody you can go and listen to them and be deceived and uh you know in eternity there will be a shock so yeah coming back to uh, revelation 224 and then revelation 225 nevertheless what you have fall fast until i come uh Krateo is that word, hold fast. And the same Krateo is used just in the next chapter, 3.11, Revelation 3.11. I am coming quickly, hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. So there is a possibility that if you don't hold fast, but the Lord has given to us or the revelation, the light that the Lord has given to us, if you do not hold fast and be faithful to the little light the Lord has given us, <laughs> uh, our if you do not fall fast that there is a possibility that uh, the lord will have to take away our crown to somebody else the crown that the crown of life that proportion of life that the lord wanted to give to us because we were unfaithful the lord had to give that ministry and that crown to some other person who is faithful just like if there are two lamps burning one lamp is burning nicely and the lamp is just uh, just like the wick is wet and all it is just a smoldering wick what we will do we will take this lamp also uh, the oil from this lamp also and pour on to the good lamp so that there will be bright light so like that to him who has more will be given to him who does not have whatever he has also will be taken away we read that in matthew 25 and uh, Luke's Gospel 19 and all, we read the same thing. Even in Mark 4, we read the same thing. So, yeah, uh, so hold fast until I come. The Lord is, uh, we might think that the Lord is delaying, but it is not delaying, but the Lord is waiting for uh, many, many people to come to repentance. The Lord wants everyone to come to repentance, but uh, and of course, only there will be a few who find the way to life, Matthew 7, 13. And the Lord wants them to come to repentance and uh, hold fast until I come. Uh, like the foolish virgins, uh, you know, we shouldn't be foolish enough to, we shouldn't be foolish enough not to uh, carry the flask of oil. We need to be faithful to the Lord and in everyday life as we surrender ourselves to the Lord, the Lord will give us the life of the Holy Spirit, the oil just hidden in the lamps, but which the Lord sees our, the life, you know, hidden life. The life of God in our hidden life, in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. <clears throat> so hold fast. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds. So uh, here, you know, all the other uh, promises, he who overcomes. They have in Revelation 2, 7. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to eat of the tree of life. And um, the, here in verse 11, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Verse 11 and verse 17. He who overcomes to him, I'll give some of the hidden manna. And uh, here, uh, Revelation 3, 5, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And uh, Revelation 3, 12, he who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Revelation 3, 21, he who overcomes, I'll grant to him to sit down. And here to the church in Thyatira, along with he who overcomes, one more phrase is also added, one more clause is also added over there. What is that? He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end. Keeps, that I owe that word we saw in the first Bible studies. He who keeps my deeds, the Lord's deeds. 
Jesus says that uh, uh, in John 14, he who believes in me, he will do what I do and greater things than this. So if we turn to that verse in John 14, uh, verse 12, where Jesus says about his deeds. Truly, truly, I say to you, John 14, 12, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. The works that I do, that means the good works that the Father has given him to do. Not the miracles and all. Miracles and all part of the ministry. But the deeds in our daily life where we do from the Lord, through the Lord, to the glory of the Lord. Romans eleven thirty six from God, through God and to God. Those are the deeds that are of any value in eternity. Those are the gold, silver, and precious stones that will stand the test of fire. First Corinthians 3, 12 to 15. So Jesus says, he who believes in me, if we address ourselves to the Lord, the works that the Lord does, we will be able also to do, uh, to manifest the life of Christ through our words and deeds. And uh, greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. The Lord wanted to do something greater also because he is going to the Father. He is entrusted that to his disciples, that is us. And the greater work that Jesus couldn't do when he was on earth, but he is doing through us today is building the body of Christ. Because on earth, what, I mean, as we uh, you know clearly have heard from Brother Zach, that greater work is the building of the body of Christ. It's not just a fancy idea because on earth, Jesus couldn't do couldn't make two people into one <laughs> because even at the last supper the disciples were arguing who is the greatest but after the day of Pentecost because uh, Jesus went to the Father the Holy Spirit could be poured out and the, when they surrendered themselves and the Holy Spirit flooded them and the whole, from the from their life the life of Christ emanated flowed forth and from the lives of the other disciples of also the life of Christ flowed forth and that life, there was a union in that life. There was a oneness in their spirit. They were one with the Lord and they were one with each other. And they could uh, function as one body in Christ. There was no division. Everybody wanted to do God's will, not their own will. Uh, you know, when Jesus was still there on the earth, they just wanted to do their own will. They wanted to uh, sit at the right hand and left hand and they want to, wanted to become the greatest and all. And uh, the, you know, when somebody wants to do his own will, he won't be he won't be able to become one with the Lord nor with his people. But when we have surrendered our will, we'll be able to one, become one with the Lord, and then we'll be able to become one with those people who wants to do only the Lord's will. And that is the body of Christ. Those who want only the uh, do only the body of Christ, only the will of God. Of course, there would be in the church, there would be many people who want to do their own will, but that won't comprise the body of Christ. The real body of Christ in a church gathering are only those people who want to do only the will of God. Uh, you know, the church would be having hundreds of number, but in God's eyes, sometimes there won't be any people at all because there won't be any body at all. The part of the body, they, they might be born again believers, but there won't be any body there. But, uh, uh, you know, what we pray and believe is that in our churches there should be a core where those who do want to do only the Lord's will, those who, those who form the core of the church, that, that would be the real strength of the church. Because there would be many people sitting at the periphery, even like Judas Iscariot betraying the Lord. Uh, they wouldn't have any power in the church. Jesus didn't let Judas have any power in, the, in his ministry. So, uh, greater thing that uh, Jesus couldn't do on this earth was building the body of Christ. So he who keeps my deeds, so the Lord is doing that. Uh, the Lord is doing the life of Christ from my individual life and the life through the body of Christ. The greater work that Jesus did, couldn't do when he was on earth but now he is doing through the Holy Spirit. Uh, so he who keeps, he who overcomes and keeps my deeds. So in the Thayatana church, uh, you know, the Jezebel was running the show and uh, uh, the effeminate elder was there as a puppet and uh, so many things were there. But there were uh, some people who were sighing and who were praying for the Lord's name to be glorified. And uh, the Lord says, he who overcomes and who keeps my deeds, he who has, uh, they, they have the deeds wrought in God as James, sorry, as John 3.19 says. John 3.19 says about the 
true works of God. What is that? John 3, uh, 19 uh, says about the judgment, light has come to the world, men love the darkness, for the deeds, deeds be evil. And everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds would be exposed. I, I wanted to refer to verse 21, John 3, 21, but he who practices the truth, who practices the truth, he who is led by the truth, the very life of God, comes to the light of the Lord, comes to the light, comes to Jesus, comes to the light of the life of Christ, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. His deeds were wrought in God. That means his deeds were worked out by God. He didn't work out his deeds, but rather it was from the Lord. The Lord gave him prompting. He did with the Lord's power and he did for the glory of the Lord. His deeds were wrought in God. And he is the one who practices the truth and he is the one who comes to the light of God and his deeds would be manifested uh, as having been wrought in God. Those are the ones who keeps the Lord's deeds. So, uh, you know, Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ is living his life. I, uh, you know, the, life, the Lord is doing his good deeds through me whatever the good deeds the Lord has prepared before. And Ephesians 2, 10 says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good deeds. which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Lord has already prepared some good deeds for us beforehand. And when we walk with the Lord, the Lord is living out his life through us and he is keeping his deeds through our life. He who overcomes, he who overcomes what? We already saw that. What we need to overcome is basically our self-life. And our self-life is being overcome. Uh, you know, we are overcoming the world also and the ruler of the world, Satan also. Uh, Satan, world, and our flesh. Those are the things that we need to overcome. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, we were seeing that devil, flesh, devil, world, flesh. Devil is the ruler of the world and the world system is the money, honor, and pleasures. And the corresponding lust for money and honor and pleasures are there in our self-will, in our flesh. And when we overcome our self-life, when we overcome our flesh, we are overcoming the world and the flesh, the world and the devil also. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. We have goods here, John 16, 33. And here, Jesus says, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds uh, in his life, there will be the deeds of Christ that would be manifested. Whatever the Lord has prepared beforehand for us, that would be uh, that would be worked out in our life every day as we walk with the Lord. The Lord has already, uh, you know, seen our days even when none was there. Uh, Psalm 139, 16, 17, we read that. And every day as we walk with the Lord, when the Lord speaks through us and does th things through us, yeah, keep, we can keep his deeds, even in the mundane things of our life. If we are faithful, the little things, whatever we do, we do it as unto the Lord. Even the mundane work in the kitchen or in the household or in our office or in our factory or in our travel. Whatever we do, if we do it as unto the Lord, we are keeping the Lord's deeds. And uh, uh, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds and sometimes when we get an opportunity to tell about the Lord to somebody, we can glorify the Lord through a conversation, through ordinary conversation. We can encourage others, we can comfort others, we can correct others according to the receptiveness and guide them and comfort them. And when we are a light to the world through the life of Christ, we are keeping his deeds, even in the mundane, ordinary things of life. We may not have preached great sermons or done huge ministry in the eyes of the world, but whatever the Lord has planned for us, if we have done that faithfully, as Mother Teresa said, uh, you know, we can, we may not be able to do great things for God, but we can do small things for the great God that uh, who has called us, something like that. You know, we may, we may not be able to do great things for God, but we can do small things for our, for this great God. <laughs> so, uh, small things, uh, some acts of love and kindness and some help and uh, not like Martha, you know, doing doing whatever that comes to our mind, but like Mary sitting at the Lord's feet and listening and with the Lord's prompting, with the Lord's power, for the Lord's glory. From God, through God, to God, whatever we do for his glory, that he who uh, keeps my deeds until the end, not uh, once in a while, but until the end, until our last breath or until the day of the Lord's coming. 
which is very near to him i will grant, i will give authority over the nations oh that is a great promise the lord's promise is that not only in future to he who overcomes and to he who keeps i mean just like we saw to him who overcomes i will eat a uh, grant to eat of the tree of life of course that ultimate fulfillment there in eternity would be there but even today we can partake of the tree of life we can partake of the life of christ and we can be unheard by the second death verse 11 and we can partake of the hidden manna from the most holy place a revelation from the lord's word and a white stone intimacy with the lord with a new name written on the stone it's uh, that bridal intimacy with the lord and all even today we can experience that if we overcome the in the measure that we overcome we'll be able to experience partaking of the tree of life and uh, uh, you know overcoming the death that comes from sin and overcoming and uh, partaking of the hidden manna and bridal intimacy with the lord just like that the lord will give us spiritual authority as we put the topic today receiving true spiritual authority from the lord for what <laughs> not a lord over other people but to wash other people's feet to serve other people to impart life to them <clears throat> what is this authority that the lord gives us for you know even in the book of final triumph i you know even recently i was just going through that uh, and i still remember many years ago when i first read that book probably 20 22 years ago when i first read the book uh, also uh, this words that is uh, that is called, referred to there in this context of verse 26 has stuck to my heart uh, i have shared uh, many a time here also you all would have noticed that john 17 verse 2 says about why god gives us authority why god the father gave the son authority and that is the same reason why lord gives us authority sometimes in the church sometimes in the you know of course in our family we need spiritual authority as a father as a husband as a mother as a elder sister or elder brother to our younger siblings uh and uh, we need spiritual authority to take a stand for the lord in our workplace and uh, you know that uh, spiritual authority and dignity of the lord for what not to lord over other people and control other people and uh, just like many dictators in the world and uh, so called dict- uh, many dictator like people uh, in the so called churches not like that but uh, john 17:2 even as you gave him that is even if even as you gave the lord jesus authority over all flesh there the word flesh uh, denotes people authority over all flesh that to all whom you have given him the, the father has given him authority over all flesh some people the lord has given including us yeah, the, those 11 disciples and verse 20 says that those who uh hear the word through those leaven and come to the faith verse 20 i did not ask we have did not ask on behalf of these alone but for all, but for those also who believe in me through their word that is we all people so uh the father has given us all to whom to jesus the son the that to all whom you have given him he may give eternal life oh the father gave us uh, gave the lord jesus spiritual authority so that to those who the father has given to him that is we people the lord would be able to give us life and life in abundance and what is the eternal life verse three next words the very next verse this is eternal life that they may know you uh, the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent that you may know the father god as your father is your own daddy as your papa uh, who you can trust and uh, you can experience that fatherly affection and love and care and compassion and strictness and jesus christ as your bridegroom as your uh, as your elder brother as your forerunner as your shepherd as your king you can uh, experience him and these are all and the life is through the holy spirit we experience that life Uh, of knowing the lord and the father through the holy spirit so that is the life that is eternal life and uh, god the father gave jesus spiritual authority to give to impart life to people and the lord gives us spiritual authority also for no other reason at all 
you know many time in the world even the babylonian churches people wants to lord over other people oh i am the maharaja here everybody should obey me i am here to rule over you that is how it is among the gentiles jesus says but not among you here actually it is serving uh and sometimes of course we need to exercise spiritual authority and say, say strong things and uh, use the uh, you know say the money changes out of the temple and uh, say strong things actually even uh, we need to wield that sharp to us word verse 12 revelation 2 12 and uh, slay the false teachings in the church and slay the spirit of uh, jezebel in the church and all things are there we need to speak against the a loss of first love and we need to you know we need to we may have to use many strong words according to the authority the lord gives us but not to hurt other people or not to offend them intentionally or not to lord over them or control them or not to impress them that you are a great preacher or anything like that but rather to serve them and uh, you need to you want to wash their feet uh, as Jesus did in John 13, uh, to him, to such people, to who, he who overcomes his self-life and he who keeps the Lord's deeds uh, in, opposite, in contrast to the Jezebel's deeds, Jezebel's deeds was there, but he who keeps my deeds until I come, to him I'll give authority over the nations. So, I mean, actually, uh, in the Thayatara Church, the Lord would have selected some people from that rest of the people who were not holding on to the teaching, the you know, the elder didn't repent. The Lord would have uh, selected one among them to lead the flock from then onwards. So, uh, to him, I'll give authority over the nations. Uh, and there is a quotation from the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 2, verse 8. Psalm 2 is a famous Messianic Psalm, Psalm that prophesies about the coming Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. And uh, he shall rule them. Uh, actually, uh, poimeno is the Greek word used over there. Poimeno literally means shepherd. Uh, uh, poimeno. And, uh, you know, that uh, noun form just means shepherd. This is, uses the same word uh, repeatedly in John 10. Uh, you know, Jesus would have spoken Aramaic, but John the Apostle, when he wrote in Greek, he uh, uses that word many times in John's gospel chapter 10 where Jesus says in verse 11 and verse 14 I am the good shepherd and the uh, word for good shepherd uh, the word for shepherd is poimain and poimeno is the word used over here which is the verbal form I will so that is the a true elder brother or a facilitator mm -hmm. a true uh, you know uh, person with spiritual authority will rule them not rule them but rather shepherd them that that should be the translation he should he will shepherd them with a rod of iron and there is a rod of iron that means actually spiritual authority is there and of course that rod of iron denotes the sharp words uh, that the lord speaks uh, because actually then it says that as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces you know with a rod of iron it is not difficult to uh, you know break a uh, earthen vessel to pieces earthen vessel rod of iron you know that is the spiritual authority uh, you know that uh, you can wield the spirit a person who keeps the lord's deeds there would be spiritual authority to uh, where the vessels of the pot uh, are broken to pieces as i also have authority received authority from the father and uh, this vessels of the pot and all actually there is quotation from if we turn to psalm 2 verse 8 that is the prophecy about messiah but, uh, you know, the Lord's servant also. Uh, Psalm 2, verse 8, Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and uh, you shall shatter them like earth and well. That is the messianic authority. Break them with a rod of iron, and shatter them like earth and well. And the same uh, words that we uh, see here in Revelation chapter 19, Verse 15, uh, Revelation 19, <clears throat> verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, you know, that is the word of God, so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod, rod of iron. That uh, rod of iron symbolizes the spiritual authority uh, where there will be words, uh, you know, words of authority and he 
tre treads the wine press of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. You know, where that is the description of about Jesus there in verse 15. They will be because uh, the judgment against the sinners and all are there, the Armageddon war and all are being uh, described over there in that context. So that is why it says he treats the wine press of the fierce wrath of God. Uh, so he, he will rule them with a rod of iron. And this shattering of the uh, earthenware to pieces, uh, similar phrases are there in many parts of the Old Testament. Uh, one or two cross references. Uh, uh, I'll just uh, go to that is one is Jeremiah 19. Jeremiah 19, 11. We'll uh, finish with uh, this Revelation chapter 2 so that, uh, you know, next week uh, we can start. God building with the Revelation chapter 3. So I'll just, uh, uh, you know, finish those, uh, finish seeing those verses. Jeremiah 19, verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 19. There also we read about the smashing of the earthenware. So, of course, that earthenware, we know, uh, you know, earthenware is the treasures uh, the uh, treasure of the life of Christ is there, Second Corinthians 4, 7. That earthen where in Gideon's army, in Judges, it was broken and the light was shining forth and the enemy was confused and defeated. So today also the earthen vessel of our outer man, our flesh, our self-life has to be smashed. And of course, a person with spiritual authority would be able to wield the rod of iron in such a way that uh, he would be able to shepherd uh, uh, the people under him uh, to the slaying of their self-life, to the death of their self-life and he would be able to guide them to receive the life of Christ more and more. He would be able to impart the life of Christ to them through his words and his deeds. Uh, that is the true spiritual authority. So Jeremiah uh, 19 says about Jeremiah 19 verse 10, then you are to break the jar in the sight of the men who accompany, accompany you and say to them, thus says the Lord of us, just so will I break this people and the city, even as one breaks a potter's vessel, uh, which cannot be, which cannot again be repaired. They will bury in Tophet because there is no other place for burying. So there are also this uh, exercising spiritual authority and uh, people, uh, you know, just like, uh, water's vessel is broken, I will break the people and the city. There will be judgment upon them. And today the judgment is upon our own self-life and uh, so that we can receive the more of it. So that picture is the, the uh, you know, the breaking of the water's vessel. That picture is used many times in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 19, 11, we saw. Uh, Psalm 92, 9, we already saw. Another uh, verse is uh, Isaiah chapter 30, Isaiah chapter 3, 0. And one... <coughs> <laughs> verse 1 4 Isaiah chapter 30 uh, verse 14 whose collapse is like the smashing of a potter's jar who so ruthlessly shattered that a shirt will not be uh, found among its pieces to take fire from a hearth uh, or to scoop water from a cistern to scoop water from a cistern you need some at least if, even if it is a broken piece, if it is a large broken piece, you can take some water in the cistern or you can take fire from a hearth. But, uh, you know, the shirt will not be found among its pieces to take that because actually it will be so shattered. <laughs> so that is the uh, example used over there. The Lord also wants to shatter our self-life to such pieces that he would be able to impart more and more of the life of Christ and that life would be manifested to others. Uh, you know, just after Paul says in Second Guru, then 4, 7 about the treasure in the earthen vessels, the light of the treasure, light of the life of God in the, uh, as the treasure in the earthen vessels. The next verse he says that we are pressed and hard pressed on other, either side. We turn to Second Guru, then 4, verse 7, treasure in earthen vessels. Uh, so, so that the surpassing greatness of the power, what is the treasure? There is a light, verse 6, light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, light of the knowledge, knowing the glory, the character of God in the face of Christ, in the life of Christ. And this treasure is there, this life of Christ is there in the earthen vessels. And uh, then it says that, uh, so that the surpassing greatness of power will, not, will be of God and not from ourselves. When uh, the treasure is manifested to others, others know that it is not from these because of the merit of these people, but it is God who is working in, through them. 
uh, and to in order to break this earthen vessel what is the lord doing verse 8 we are second corinthians 4 8 we are afflicted in every way but not crushed perplexed but not despairing persecuted but not forsaken struck down but not destroyed always carrying about in the body the words that we refer many a time always carrying about in the body the dying of jesus that is this breaking of the earthen vessel so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. We who are live, we who live are constantly being delivered. We ourselves carry about the dying of Jesus. And when the Lord is seeing that we are so eager for the life of Christ, the Lord will Himself will deliver us constantly over to death for Jesus' sake through many people and circumstances. So that the life of Jesus also would be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, that is the bringing of the earth and vessel, but life works in you. Uh, works in us also and it overflows and it will impart life to other people also. That is a ministry. Verse 12. That is the true spiritual authority. So we would be able to have more and more spiritual authority to impart life to other people, to our family members, to uh, our church members, to our younger brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll have more of that spiritual authority to guide them to Christ, to guide them to take hold of eternal life, like Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 12. Take hold of eternal life. Many times we commonly hear in Christendom says about eternal life as being born again. But eternal life is actually uh, when we become born again, we start and we began to have a drop of eternal life, but we need to have that life and life in abundance. John 10 10. So we need to take hold of the eternal life. That is that life of God. That is that knowing of God more and more in our life. And uh, when we keep the Lord's deeds until the end and uh, we overcome, the Lord will give us spiritual authority so that we will be able to shatter this earthen pieces. Uh, because in our own lives, if the earthen pieces have been broken down in that measure, we'll be able to shatter the earthen vessels in other people's life also so that uh, you know, we might have to strongly correct them and rebuke them, you know, just like Jesus did to his disciples, even Paul and all. But uh, that is not to, uh, no, not to destroy them, but so that the their self-life would be broken and they would receive more of the life of Christ. And even that word of rebuke will be like an uh, oil, uh, an oil of anointing upon our head. We know that verse in Psalm. You know, or that correction, the word, let the righteous smite me. And that would be like a oil upon my head. That is what we read in Psalm uh, 144. Isn't it 140? Uh, Psalm, whether it is, let me see whether I'll be able to, yeah, 141 rather. Psalm 141, Psalm 141 verse 5. Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. That is shattering the oil, sh shattering the, you know, glass, uh, earthenware. And then I'll receive more of the anointing. Uh, it is oil upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it. Uh, it's what the part of God says. For still my prayer is against the wicked deeds. Because, uh, you know, David was uh, praying against the wicked deeds and all. And, uh, you know, when a righteous person corrects us, and we receive that correction, it will be more of life, more of life to us. Uh, you know, when Peter was uh, rebuked by the Lord, get behind me, Satan. And that around that same time, only Peter is telling Jesus in John 6, 67, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Even these words of correction, calling me Satan also, are words of eternal life that imparts more of life to me. And uh, where, where will I go? You alone have the words of eternal life is what Peter responded. And like Judas, Judas, even for a mild correction, he got offended and he wanted to betray Jesus. Matthew 26, we read that. But not Peter. That's when the Lord could use Peter. Uh, the Lord had to severely correct him, rebuke him. But uh, the Lord could use him. Even just after a few pages, uh, Proverbs 123 is another uh, word there. The Lord is reproving, reproving us or rebuking us. Uh, you know, we know we as fathers and mothers, we sometimes we have to speak strictly to our children, not to, uh, you know, destroy them or disgrace them, but we want them to come to the Lord and receive more of his life. And we want uh, them to, uh, it, it, we want it to go well with them. So Proverbs 123, turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. 
you know, when you turn to the reproof of the Lord, the Lord would be your self life is broken. Yeah, when you, you know, uh, surrender to the sharp words of correction that an elder brother, that a uh, brother with uh, spiritual authority upon you is telling you, surrender to that. And of course, that will be, uh, that will be more of spirit on you. More of the Lord would be pouring out his spirit on you and the Lord will be giving his revelation from the word of God. I will make my words known to you. The word of God, the spirit of God and the word of God. Uh, we will receive more of the life through the Holy Spirit and more of the revelation from the word of God <laughs> when we turn to the reproof. Uh, we know that Jesus surrendered, submitted, continued in subjection to his parents and he grew in wisdom. We all know that was in Luke 2, 51 and 52. And because he surrendered him, uh, continued in subjection to his parents, the father could give him more of the Holy Spirit. And we, because he uh, continued in surrender, that is, continued to uh, submit and be humble, God gives grace to the humble and Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace and wisdom. And the Lord could give him more of the wisdom. He could grow in wisdom. So that's how when we have spiritual authority, we can impart life to other people. We might be speaking to them strongly, of course, not strongly all the time, but of course, encouraging them, correcting them, guiding them, shepherding them. But uh, even when we exercise spiritual authority, it is uh, even if the earthen vessel is broken to pieces, it is but more of the life of Christ. And that is how Jesus also has received authority from his father. When, you know, uh, Jesus, uh, how did Jesus receive spiritual authority? When Jesus was finishing the Sermon on the Mount, everyone was astonished. Matthew 7, 27, 28. Oh, he's speaking not like the scribes and the Pharisees. He's speaking with authority because from his life he was speaking. And where did he get his authority? Not because he was the second person of the Trinity, but he came just like him, just like any of us as a man. He was made in, made in, made like his brethren in all points, Hebrews 2, 17. And, but he, because he continued to surrender, and uh, he was a zero before the father. The father could even the Holy Spirit and the life of heaven. And with that authority only, he could preach the word of God. Even when we preach for two minutes or justify for one minute, we can do that with a, you know, that spiritual authority where we speak from our life. So uh, that is how Jesus received authority from the Father. That's how I'll grant you also authority, the Lord is saying to us. And I'll give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the Jesus. What is this morning star? Jesus says the same thing. Jesus says, I am the morning star. Revelation 22, last page of our Bible. Revelation 22, verse 16. And then Jesus clarifies that I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So Jesus is the bright morning star. And Jesus says that I will give myself to you. Jesus is called the son of righteousness. Of course, in the final triumph, you would have read that uh, in Malachi, the last page of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. Uh, there Jesus is referred to as the son of righteousness, son. Uh, there is son of Jesus is the son of righteousness and the morning star. To whom Jesus is the son of righteousness and to whom Jesus is the morning star? That is a question. So here, uh, Malachi chapter 4 verse 1, Behold, the day is coming burning like a furnace and all the arrogant and the evildoer will be chaff and the day that is coming will set them ablaze so that it will leave uh, them neither root nor branch. Then it says, verse 2, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its feet. So uh, to the Jewish people, uh, to the people who to whom the judgment was there, uh, Jesus is revealing themselves as the revealing to themselves as the son of righteousness. But we know uh, what is a morning star. Morning star is the star that would be there in the sky before the sunrise. In the darkest hour, just before the sunrise, there will be this morning star. And uh, so in the great tribulation, the darkest hour of the great tribulation, suddenly Jesus will appear as a morning star to the bride of Christ, to the church that is taken as the bride of Christ. And uh, when Jesus... Uh, so we who are overcomers will be able to see Jesus as the morning star. And after that, then we will be descending to earth. And then to earth in that Armageddon war, Jesus is revealing himself as the one who judges the people and they will be 
slaying of the wicked and uh, wrath of God being poured out at all. There Jesus is revealing himself as the son of righteousness. So to the overcomers, <coughs> Jesus is saying, I will give him the morning star. So those who overcome all these false practices in the churches and the self-life and the traditions and all that and keeps the Lord's deed until the end, the Lord will give us authority and he will reveal himself to us as his as uh, as our spiritual bridegroom uh, who will be like a morning who is the morning star uh, not as the one who is going to judge the world but as the morning star because we have already judged our life if, if anybody judges his life uh, judges himself rightly he will not be judged but if we do not judge our life and all of course there will be many things that the lord has to judge before the judgment seat and all. But if we judge, our, judge ourselves rightly, uh, there is nothing more to judge. And the Lord is saying that I am not as the son of, right, son of righteousness to you, but I am like the morning star to you. If these are not fancy ideas, he was in a year, verse 29, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit is saying not only the Thayatara church, to the churches, to all the churches, even to us also today. The Holy Spirit is saying, he who overcomes, I'll give authority. I'll give myself as a morning star. And uh, if we have years to respond, we can respond to that and say that, Lord, I want to keep your needs until the end. I do not want to compromise with any Jezebel fans association. I do not want to be a man pleaser. I want to stand for your truth. But uh, Lord, I want to be zero. I want your authority, not any human anger and human authority at all. But Lord, I want your authority and so that I can impart your life to other people. So, shall we respond to the Lord in prayer and uh, continue to hear from our dear brothers and sisters. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. Yes, Lord, we want you to give us spiritual authority in whatever sphere that we need so that, Lord, we can impart your life to others. Help each one of us, Father. And we want you to be revealed to us as a bright morning star, not as a judge, but as a bridegroom to receive you as a bridegroom, as a wise virgin, Lord. Help us all to have a flask full of oil of the life of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Help each one of us and help all these words to become flesh in our lives so that, Lord, one day when we stand before your judgment seat, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything to be judged there because we would have already judged everything righteously according to the light Lord, that you have given us, Lord. Help us to judge ourselves every day in your light and to, rep and to repent and to cling on to you, Lord Jesus. Help us to be faithful to that most. Help each one of us, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this blessed fellowship that you have enabled us to gather like this <coughs> for all these years, Lord. And we want to surrender it to your will. Let your will be done. Let your name be glorified. Even as we plan to continue this as a Malayalam Bible study from next week onward. Lord, we pray that, Lord, your will be, will be done and your kingdom come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.